So we're going to go ahead and get started. Let me just say, as I always do, remind you that I am not your doctor. I wish I were, but I'm not. So this is just general educational information. And today we're going to talk about the gut sleep connection. And we'll just start with a little anecdote. This weekend I was in New York. It was a friend's birthday, sort of landmark birthday. It was my husband on Saturday. It was my husband's birthday on Sunday. And uh, I had a work meeting on Monday for sort of a, a new project. So there was a lot going on this weekend in New York. And let me just say in the words of my dearly beloved and departed mother-in-law, we oversupported ourselves on Saturday night. Yes, after the party, some friends invited us for a nightcap and we stayed out way too late. And we, you know, we imbibed generously. And on Sunday, we had to go and see a play. And fortunately, we were just sitting and it was quiet. But here's the thing. It was really the lack of sleep that I felt. Truth is, I didn't have that much to drink. I had a couple of drinks. But we did not get to bed till 3.30 in the morning on Sunday morning. And that is very unusual for us. My husband tends to go to bed a little earlier. He's usually in bed by 10. I'm a bit of a night owl. But I try not to let you know midnight catch me still awake. And we slept in on Sunday morning and my husband kept saying, why do we feel so badly? Like we feel terrible. And I explained that you can't pay off a sleep debt. So, you know, if you lose those significant hours between I'd say 11 p.m. and 3 a.m. and we'll talk about that during the session, you can't just sleep later and make up for it. It doesn't work that way. And so not getting sleep and missing those critical hours of sleep really sets you back. So let's talk first generally about sleep and how important it is. And then I wanna to talk to you about the gut sleep connection because that is something that is really just fascinating. And like a lot of things going on in the gut, it has so many implications for other important functions like our immune system, for example. So. Um, I'm a fan of a book called Why We Sleep by uh, neuroscientist Matthew Walker. Great book to check out. And if you are not able to read the whole book, check out his podcast, check out his interview on the Ritual podcast. It's really worth listening to. So Matthew Walker in his great book, Why We Sleep, describes an experiment that happens globally amongst 1.6 billion people in 70 different countries when everybody loses an hour of sleep. It's called daylight savings time, right? So in the spring, we spring forward and we lose an hour of sleep. 1.6 billion people lose an hour of sleep. And what happens the next day is that emergency rooms note a 24% increase in the number of heart attacks the next day after we lose an hour of sleep. And what happens in the fall when we fall back and we get an extra hour of sleep? they notice a 21% decrease in heart attacks the next day. This is very real. That is how significant losing an hour of sleep can be for your cardiovascular health. Well, what about our risk of viruses? You know, we're living in the age of viral pandemics. A study from the British Medical Journal showed that chronic sleep deprivation can make you up to 88% more likely to end up with a viral infection, 88%. But the flip, the converse is also true. So for every additional hour of sleep you get, your risk of contracting a viral infection decreases by about 12%. And it's not just acute infection, it turns out that vaccine efficacy is strongly linked to sleep. So we've seen this with a flu vaccine and we've seen this with a hepatitis vaccine and we've seen it with a coronavirus vaccine that sleep deprivation in the two hours before, in the, sorry, in the two days prior to getting your vaccine can reduce the effectiveness of the vaccine by 50%. I am not making this up, I promise. In fact, when my daughter was getting her vaccine last year, um, she was rowing during the summer, she's a rower and she had a regatta and you know they get up at all sorts of crazy hours in the morning for these races. And I told her, I said, no, we've got to reschedule this because you are getting up at 445 and you know, you're going to be sleep deprived. So we're going to reschedule this for a time when you don't have an early morning regatta and when I can guarantee that you've had a couple good nights sleep. So again, a real phenomenon, a decrease by as much as 50% efficacy for some of these vaccines if you are sleep deprived in the two days leading up to the vaccine. So why is that, right? Why does sleep so profoundly affect our immune response? It's because when you sleep, it may seem like you're not doing anything, 
but nothing could be farther from the truth. When you are asleep, your whole body is sort of rebooting and particularly your immune system. So new neural pathways are being laid down, new cytokines are being produced. The immune cells are basically sort of revamping and rebooting, kind of like when you close your computer when it overheats and it reboots or something like that. <laughs> um, I know my computer gets hot when I've been using it for a long time, I have to close it down. And then when I start it again, it seems to be good. So I think that's a computer analogy for sleep, but not being an IT person myself, as, as Leanne can attest to, um, I can't tell you what's going on with the computer, but I can tell you what is going on with your body. So again, everything is rebooting, but particularly your immune system. So there are a ton of studies out there showing that chronic sleep deprivation can really mess up your immune system in terms of activity of T cells, cytokines, et cetera. So again, super, super important. There's some landmark studies that show that risks of coughs, colds, viral infections, even pneumonia are dramatically increased when you lose sleep. But I wanna drill down beyond sort of general to the gut sleep connection, because that's what we're talking about today. So what does what's going on in your gut have to do with your sleep patterns? Okay, so there are two really important mechanisms that I want you to know about. The first is a hormonal mechanism. You've probably heard of the gut hormone serotonin. People refer to serotonin as a feel-good hormone because it's a hormone that's associated with a sort of elevated mood and sometimes even feelings of euphoria. So serotonin, 80 to 90% of it is produced in the gut and it's produced by gut bacteria. And we need to have a certain complement of gut bacteria. We need to have certain levels of diversity. We need to have a healthy microbiome. In other words, to make sure that our production of serotonin is adequate and is staying on track. Serotonin, which is one of the substances that makes serotonin is the amino acid tryptophan. Serotonin is also a precursor hormone to melatonin, the sleep hormone. So you see where I'm going with this. If your gut bacteria are messed up, you don't have sufficient, you're not making sufficient levels of serotonin, you are not going to make sufficient levels of melatonin and your sleep is gonna get messed up. And let me tell you a little bit about how melatonin works because this stuff is so, it's just so incredibly well designed, you know? I don't know, you, you couldn't think about this in terms of if you were trying to design a, a circuit, I don't know how we could come up with this. So, you, you know, this stuff just evolves because it serves us well. So here's how melatonin works. At night, as the light gets dimmer, which is what's supposed to happen, you're not supposed to be on your computer or phone or tablet at night, it's supposed to get dark. The amount of light that your optic nerve is taking in from the environment decreases. Okay, as it gets dark. And so as the amount of light the optic nerve sees drops, the brain starts to produce melatonin and that makes you sleepy. So that makes perfect sense, right? Nighttime, it's a circadian rhythm, nighttime, sunset, light goes down, less light coming into the optic nerve, melatonin secretion goes up and you fall asleep. Fantastic. The opposite is what happens in the morning. So in the morning, the sun comes up, the light coming in through your optic nerve in your eye increases and melatonin secretion drops. Perfect. Now, the problem is if your gut bacteria are messed up and your serotonin production is messed up, your melatonin production is gonna be messed up too and you're not gonna be secreting enough melatonin and you're not going to be, those sleep cues, those light dark cycle sleep cues are not going to result in falling asleep and waking up as you normally would. So that's one really important mechanism to keep in mind. If you check us out on Instagram, you know, a couple of weeks ago, I talked about this study linking antibiotic use with cognitive decline in women. This was part of the nurses health study, 14,000. We'll do a separate office hours on it. In fact, I think that's coming up. Um, antibiotics and cognitive decline is maybe coming up next week. Check out the uh, gutless.com website for the schedule or you can go to Linktree and Instagram and, and I have them on there too. But anyway, that study showed that taking antibiotics for two months or more in women in, the, in midlife in their 50s was associated with a really significant drop in cognitive 
sort of global cognitive function. And it was a seven point decline, but what does that really mean? It was equivalent of aging three to four years in terms of your cognitive function. So that was a, a clear link between antibiotic use and cognition. And we also have those links now between antibiotic use and sleep because of this whole correlation between serotonin production. So take a lot of antibiotics, messes up your microbiome, messes up serotonin production, messes up melatonin production, messes up sleep. And again, I'm, I'm always quick to point out that antibiotics save millions of lives every year, but they are also incredibly overused. As much as 50% of antibiotic use is inappropriate according to the CDC. So the next time you have a cough or a cold or a sinus infection, and somebody prescribes an antibiotic, I want you to think really carefully about that and think about the implications for cognition and for sleep. Okay, so mechanism one, serotonin, melatonin. Mechanism number two is we have this gut-brain connection, the gut-brain axis. And a lot of those signals between the gut and the brain and the brain and the gut, because it's bidirectional, occur through the vagus nerve, the 10th cranial nerve. And you have substances that are made in the gut that affect the brain, and you also have substances in the brain that are made in the brain that affect the gut. But when you have dysbiosis, an altered gut microbiome, and your gut is off, and the gut microbes are off, you, the gut bacteria can make neuroinflammatory metabolites. Instead of making like healthy short chain fatty acids and so on, they make these metabolites that are not so great. They're neuroinflammatory, which means they, call, they cause inflammation in your neurological system, in your brain. And so these neuroinflammatory chemicals, metabolites that the gut bacteria are making can travel via the vagus nerve to the brain, and they really throw off the whole sleep cycle for the brain. So there's a hormonal pathway, and then there's a neural pathway through this bidirectional communication. So in addition to all the other just sort of general immune things, there really is this profound gut sleep connection with what's going on with your gut microbes. And, you know, in, in medicine, we sort of compartmentalize everything, right? So like, I think about orthopedic surgery. We don't just have an orthopedic surgeon. We have, you know, my brother's a spinal surgeon. I have a friend who's a hand surgeon, somebody else who's a shoulder surgeon. I mean, I don't know, maybe there's like a pinky finger surgeon in orthopedics. It's very divided up in gastroenterology. We have people who deal with the liver, people who deal with the pancreas, people who deal with um, you know, inflammatory bowel disease, my two diseases, Crohn's and ulcerative colitis. So we're also pretty specialized. There are people who deal with GI bleeding. But the thing is, the body is completely connected and the gut is connected to everything else. So even though the way the medical community approaches this stuff is in a very compartmentalized way and you have the sleep doctor, but the gut is communicating with the brain and this is all working to help you sleep or not sleep. So you have to think of it in a more sort of systems way and not isolate it and, and ideally not medicate as the first thing that you do if you're not sleeping well. In fact, if you're not sleeping well, one of the first things you might want to do is look in the medicine cabinet and say, you know, are any of the medications I'm taking here actually stimulants or have stimulant properties that are keeping me awake? Speaking of stimulants and sedatives, et cetera, I want to point out that alcohol, a lot of times people think, oh, alcohol, you know, I'll have a drink, it'll relax me, make me, you know, make me ready to get a good night's sleep. So alcohol sedates you and sedation and sleep are not the same thing. They're totally different. So alcohol actually works on the central nervous system to disrupt sleep. And so you want to make sure if you are drinking alcohol, you're not drinking it within two or three hours of going to bed. And going to bed tipsy or drunk is a guarantee for a poor night's sleep because of the disruption to the central nervous system. Caffeine, the same. Caffeine has a long half-life, half several hours. So if you're drinking coffee in the morning, that's one thing. But if you're one of those people who's like, oh, I can drink coffee at four o'clock in the afternoon, it doesn't affect me. The studies show that it actually does because of the extended half-life that it's going to, you know, if you're drinking coffee after about 12 or one in the afternoon, it is going to disrupt your sleep. Even though you may not perceive it, you may not have trouble falling asleep, but in terms of the intensity of your sleep and your REM cycles and so on are going to be affected. So here are a couple things before I start taking questions, which I'll do in just a minute. Um, we're about 12, 18, so I'll stop talking at about 12, 20. I wanna tell you about a couple things that you can do for sleep that are really important. The first is that regularity is more important than length. 
And I would argue that that's true in the gut too, right? That regularity, having a bowel movement um, every day is probably more important than whether it's a huge, you know, fantastic stool nirvana or just a little bit, but you wanna, ideally you're going every day. So if we apply that same principle to this concept of sleep, what I mean by that is having a regular bedtime and a regular wake up time is more important than how many hours of sleep you necessarily get. So to go back to that whole sleep debt concept and me telling you about my oversporting myself in New York and going to bed at 3.30 a.m. on Saturday night, really Sunday morning, and just, you know, it didn't matter how late I slept on Sunday, I still felt extraordinarily tired, is because you cannot pay down a sleep debt. It's sort of like, it doesn't work that way. You can't just be like, oh, I'll sleep extra and then I'm good. So you know, for example, on the weekends, you should ideally try and go to bed at the same time that you do during the week nights and wake up at the same time, because that sleeping in really is not restorative sleep. What it's really doing is it's just confusing your whole circadian rhythm. It's throwing that off because it thrives on regularity, like the bowels thrives on regularity. So you want to try and establish a regular bedtime and a regular wake up time regardless. And even if you do oversport yourself and you stay up a bit late, you wanna to stick to that. The other thing I wanna tell you about is napping. When you're really tired, it can be very um, appealing, this idea of taking a nap, but you have a hormone called adenosine that creates sleep pressure. So as, as you go through the day not sleeping, adenosine builds up and then at night when you sleep, it releases um, you know, that sort of sleep pressure. And so if you nap, that can release some of the sleep pressure early. And it means at night, when you try to go to bed, you don't have as much sleep pressure to help you fall asleep, if that makes sense. So if you nap, try and limit it to a brief nap, 20 or 30 minutes, and make sure it's earlier in the day, ideally before noon, super helpful. In terms of, um, you know, what you can eat or drink, I'm not a big fan of fruit juices. I'm always telling people, you know, fruit juices are just liquid sugar without the fiber, but, but there is some really compelling data about cherry juice. And we did a blog on this. We did a product review. So if you go to gutless.com and check, um, you know, just you could put it in, in the search title. It's in the blog, a product review where we reviewed tart on sweet and cherry juice. And it was really fascinating because um, tart cherry juice at night a little bit actually is superior to a melatonin supplement in terms of falling asleep it can be really helpful. And if you are feeling like you want to have a glass of Merlot, but know better because it's you know close to bedtime and you don't want to disrupt your sleep, you know, put your tart cherry juice in a wine glass and you can pretend a little bit with that. So that can be really helpful too. And then foods that are high in tryptophan. And again, we have, we have a lot of information on the website about that. So this is really just a reminder that it's all connected, you know, and how important the gut is as your engine for your entire body at regulating some of these other functions, the immune system, the brain, sleep, so let us see what we have in terms of questions. Do we have any questions? Do we have anything in the chat? All right. Any questions yet? Let's see. Maybe we're keeping looking in the wrong place here. Oh, great. Okay, we have a bunch of questions, but... Um, doesn't fruit juice have vitamins? Yes, you know, fruit juice does, but the problem is so does a whole fruit. And when you extract just the juice, it's not like you're amplifying the vitamins. You're getting the same. So if you think of an apple, an apple juice, you're getting the same vitamins that you eat when you eat the whole apple, but you're not getting the fiber. And the fiber is really important for slowing down the absorption so that you don't get that spike in insulin. Because remember, insulin is an inflammatory hormone. And it, I mean, it's an essential hormone to get glucose into cells, but high levels of insulin are associated with inflammation and spikes in glucose levels. So you don't want to spike that insulin level through a spike in glucose. So when you get the juice, you get the vitamins, but you don't get the fiber. And the fiber is really essential for slowing down the release of the sugar to avoid the insulin spike and for feeding your gut microbes. So you ideally want to do the whole fruit. So that's why I mentioned fruit juices, but thanks for asking Naomi. Um, how do weekend naps factor in, Jay? Okay, so again, 
don't over support yourself on the weekend. Um, you know, a weekend nap isn't really restorative because again, what it can do, depending on when you're napping and for how long, it can mean that that adenosine sleep pressure is lower when you go to bed at night. If you find that, you know, a quick little 15 or 20 minute lie down earlier in the day feels good and it doesn't interfere with your sleep, I think that's fine. But I think there are other ways to get some repose and rest and to relax besides actually sleeping. Um, maybe a little deep breathing, maybe a little journaling, something. But you, the goal is that you don't want to mess up that sleep pressure later at night. Okay, gosh, there's so many great questions here. Is it helpful to take melatonin supplements before bed? Hi, Jackie. Here's the thing, Jackie. Nothing is free <laughs> in life. So everything, even prenatal vitamins, you know, have a downside. And melatonin, the studies on melatonin are really not super impressive. What melatonin does, I mean, there's of course a placebo effect for a lot of these things, but what melatonin does, the supplement, is it decreases the time, the onset of sleep time, but only by about 12 minutes. So that's really not really doing yourself a huge favor there. And again, another problem with melatonin is that it's an unregulated substance in the US. So you really have no idea how much actual melatonin you are getting when you, um, you know, when you take the supplement. Here's what I'm going to do, though, I'm going to post in the blog in next month's blog, a whole guide to um, you know, it's, it's, it will be sort of excerpted from the antiviral gut because I have a big section in the book about that. So I'm going to take some of that and give you as a preview in next month's blog, um, some of these remedies, you know, how much melatonin, the cherry juice, all of that, some of the studies. So you can take a look at that. But really, if you're relying on a supplement to sleep every night, you really want, that's just a band-aid, right? What you want to do is you really want to excavate and say, why is it that I'm having trouble sleeping at night? Am I over caffeinated? Am I, you know, having too much coffee or having it too late in the day? Or maybe coffee is just not my friend. I've been caffeine free for about 23 years because I felt like I was getting dependent on caffeine. So maybe, maybe even if you're having just one cup of coffee, but it could still be disrupting things. So, you know, is it caffeine? Is it alcohol? Is it a medication that you're taking? Um, thyroid medication can be something that can be more stimulating. So take a careful look in the medicine cabinet, read the labels, look up all the medications you're on, especially the supplements and over the counters too, not just the prescription medications. The main reason that people have difficulty sleeping, it's usually not difficulty falling asleep. Most of us fall asleep but we wake up at some point in the night, in my case, to pee because I'm hydrating too late in the day. So I wake up to pee and I can't go back to sleep at night. And the reason I can't go back to sleep is because I'm mentally sort of perseverating on my to-do list for the next day. What's going on with my 17 year olds? What did I do the day before that I shouldn't have done? Whatever it is, right? So we can't kind of shut the computer in our brain down. And that is a typical pattern for insomnia. And again, here's a gut parallel. Most people who are constipated, it's not that they're not going at all, it's that they're having an incomplete bowel movement. So they go and they sit down and they're you know, excited, like, oh, this is gonna be great. And instead it's very underwhelming. It's you know, little pellets, right? Same thing for sleep. So it's not that you lie there and you, know, you can't fall asleep at all. It is that you have interrupted sleep and you have trouble getting back to sleep at night. So melatonin, um, I have to tell you, I'm quite disturbed by this trend of melatonin gummies in kids that I've been seeing with a lot of my patients and a lot of my friends giving their kids melatonin gummies like every night, young kids. I personally think it's not a great idea because again, these supplements have long-term effects. And remember anything that has an effect on your brain means it has to cross the blood brain barrier. It's affecting your central nervous system. When we look at a disorder like dementia, we know that yes, there's a genetic component, but it's really mostly environmental. It's diet, lifestyle, environment. And we definitely see a trend as a use of medications that can affect the central nervous system. So antidepressants, anti-anxiety medications, antihistamines, things like, you know, melatonin, sleep supplements, Ativan, Xanax, all of these drugs. So as we all use more of these drugs that affect the central nervous system, as our kids use more of these drugs that affect their central nervous system, we do see this trend towards more dementia. And again, keep in mind it's multifactorial. So 
I want you to think about a supplement that we know is going to affect the brain as something that is a last resort rather than the first line therapy. And then, you know, again, think about like a more relaxing routine that you can do, whether it's a warm bath, really interesting information about temperature. Your body temperature needs to drop to about 68 degrees Fahrenheit, 67, 68, for you to really get into a good deep sleep. So have the room cold if you can. I'm generally somebody who likes heat, but at sleep time, I don't mess around. The temperature set at 67 degrees. And I know that if I go to sleep with a lot of clothes on, or if I go to sleep when it's warmer, I'm gonna wake up sweating, hot, uncomfortable. Ironically, a warm bath can help with that because not a hot bath or a hot shower, warm, lukewarm, because that will actually cause some vasodilation of your blood vessels and your body can dissipate and lose some heat that way. So think about maybe something relaxing like a lukewarm, warm bath. Think about a cup of herbal tea. Think of, I mean, you have to kind of train your brain in this Pavlovian way to know that sleep is coming. So having some kind of a bedtime ritual, an herbal tea, a lukewarm bath, something relaxing. I don't need to tell you about screens, you know about screens and also the light and the optic nerve and all of that, right? Keeping light coming into the optic nerve is going to prevent the melatonin levels from rising. And yes, blue light filters and so on help, but they don't completely eradicate that effect. Okay, um, what if constipation pushes on bladder, which interrupts continuous sleep? up every one and a half hours to urinate. Yeah, Jean, I feel you, sister. Let me tell you, the, the urination, the nocturnal urination thing is real. And what I have to tell you with that is you have to hydrate earlier. I don't know how old you are, but if you're like me in the over 50 club, it is a serious problem. So you ideally want to, you know, you'll have to play around with it and see. For me, I know if I'm hydrating after eight o'clock at night, forget it, I'm up all night. So ideally you want to try and get in, take another sip, as much of your hydration as possible earlier in the day so that you're not running into that issue. And, you know, it's not just, um, you mentioned constipation pushing on the bladder. It's not just that also, it's also that as we age our pelvic floor, which is really like a hammock that all our organs rest in. So it's a hammock and what's resting there is your sigmoid and colon, you know, your gastrointestinal tract, your uterus, your bladder, it's all hanging in this on the pelvic floor. And the pelvic floor tends to descend. The hammock gets a little droopy as we get older. Sometimes the uterus changes position, it antiverts or it retroverts. And so all of that can affect the bladder and can exert more pressure on the bladder. And so that means you got to make sure your bladder is empty well before you get to bed. And Jean, again, the cutoff for you, it could be four in the afternoon, it could be six o'clock, it could be eight o'clock. So play around, but try and make sure you're getting in your hydration early. And while we're on the topic of hydration, you know, there are lots of different recommendations out there, but simple rule of thumb, half your body weight in ounces of water. So if you weigh 140 pounds, 70 ounces of water. 150 pounds, 75 ounces of water as a minimum, as a minimum, just water. Okay, is it fair to say for convenience sake, occasionally it's okay to have fruit juice? It's occasionally it's okay to have every, anything, I think. Well, you know, within reason. I don't think it's ever okay to have soda, but um, yeah, sure, absolutely. You know, every now and again, you want a little splash of pomegranate juice or something or some cherry juice, I think that's fine. Especially now, I mean, if the other things, you know, if you're eating a good balanced diet, so if you're eating lots of fibrous fruits and vegetables and so on, I think that's fine. Um, wondering if I can explain again how the gut brain axis is affected by sleep. Is it because a lack of sleep causes gut imbalance and the production of neuroinflammatory toxins? And I'm really glad that you asked me to go over that again, because there is, you know, there is um, bi-directionality to the cause and effect. But really what I'm saying is if your gut microbes are messed up, your serotonin production in the gut which is a feel-good hormone, will be messed up. And since serotonin is the precursor to melatonin, the sleep hormone, that will be messed up. Now, you raise a really important point because if your sleep is disordered, that can also affect your microbiome, right? It can work the other way too, although the impact tends to be more gut to brain in terms of the gut sleep, um, you know, what happens there. Sleep deprivation, like chronic stress, can also be potentially deleterious to the microbiome, but it tends to be the gut 
being messed up affecting the sleep. That's the more powerful of the two. So thank you for that. Oh, and the neuroinflammatory toxins are when the gut bacteria are messed up, when you have dysbiosis and imbalanced microbiome, the gut bacteria can start to produce these neuroinflammatory toxins that travel to the brain and mess up the sleep cycle. So I hope, I hope that cleared it up for you. Okay. Preston, you have been taking Ambien and triazolam for over 10 years to get to sleep. Oh, unable to reduce it and you still sleep. You also have SIBO and yeast and bad bacteria and um, uh, the raw veggie juice. I think you probably mean the smoothie, right? Reduce the pains from SIBO. I'm so glad to hear that. How can I wean off Ambien and triazolam? Well, first of all, I am so delighted that you are looking for ways to do that because yes, here's the thing, these drugs can work well in terms of doing what they're supposed to do, whether it's reducing anxiety or making you sleepy, but it comes at a price, they're habit forming and they affect your brain long-term. There is zero doubt that these drugs, drugs like Ambien and Trazolam, zero doubt, we know with 100% certainty that they affect cognition. Okay, so it, I'm so delighted and really just so proud of you that you're like, yeah, how can I get off these drugs? The fact that you've been on them for 10 years means you are probably quite, your brain is quite physiologically dependent on them. So you have to think about two things. One, when you are tapering off drugs like um, benzodiazepines, which is the Ambien, is really sort of in that class. Um, it's a first cousin. It's not technically fully benzodiazepine, but it has some of the same effects as Valium and, uh, and those drugs, is when you stop taking it, you can get rebound panic, okay? So even if you weren't panicked to start, like say I start taking Valium and I'm pretty chill, and then I'm really chill on the Valium and I'm sleeping and everything seems great. And after a month, I say, you know what? I wanna stop this Valium. So I stop the Valium. All of a sudden, I'm really panicked and like jumpy and freaked out. That wasn't my baseline. My baseline was chill, but it can induce a rebound panic above your baseline. Now that is short lived. That's not going to be forever and ever, but it's really important with these drugs that you taper. So you have to work ideally with, um, you know, maybe a psychiatrist who does pharmacology, a psychopharmacologist. What I have found in my experience is that they're not always thrilled about getting you off the drugs. So sometimes they are not so motivated because depending on their practice and their personal beliefs, they may say, well, why are you getting off this drug? It's working fine for you. Don't worry about it. So your internist can also help you and you have to work out a slow taper. It may take you six months to get off it. It may take you a year to get off it, but I'll tell you, it's a really worthwhile endeavor, but you definitely want to have them work out a taper for you. I had a patient who had been on a form of Valium, Ativan, since he was a teenager. His psychiatrist, who was a really well-meaning person and sort of a father figure to him, put him on Ativan, an anti-anxiety benzodiazepine, when he was a teenager. And, you know, this person I'm talking about is in their late 40s now, so this is a long time ago. And he had been on it literally for like three decades when he came to see me and he was having all kinds of gut issues. And he was also having a lot of anxiety and panic attacks because he had developed a tolerance, even though he was taking quite a high dose. So he was already having like rebound effects, even though he was still taking it. And I did find a really wonderful psychologist, a colleague to work with him, but it did take him about eight or nine months to get off it. And he had a lot of GI distress during that time. So some things to think about, but you absolutely can. And here's the thing. I mean, these drugs are not at the top of the list for what contributes to SIBO and so on, but they're on the list. There was a really fantastic study that was published in the journal Nature in 2020, I believe. It might've been 2018. And they looked at 41 different classes of drugs. And you guys, if you've been on these office hours, you've probably heard me talk about this study before. They looked at... Um, 41 different classes of drugs, and they found that 19 of them affected the microbiome significantly. So for example, um, Prozac was one of them that encouraged the development of resistant E. coli, SSRIs. So there were lots of drugs on there that were sort of surprising to people, right? There were even some uh, laxatives on there that were messing up the microbiome, not a huge surprise to me, but um, so yeah. I think that talking to whoever is prescribing the drug and, you know, sometimes Preston, you have to, you have to really be like 
resolute, you know, when you're advocating for your health and just say, listen, I know that these drugs can be very helpful and they've served me in many ways, but it is time. I want to get off of them and I need your help in helping me get off of them. So, you know, you kind of have to be firm because depending on who the doctor is, I mean, there are lots of doctors who believe strongly in the virtues of these medications and think that you should stay on them. So you'll have to work with them on that. Okay. How can we increase serotonin and melatonin production in the gut? Yes. So we can eat the foods. That's such a great question, Kim. Thank you. We can eat the foods. I'm just checking the time. We have lots of time. You can eat the foods that your healthy gut bacteria need. So what does that look like? That is basically high fiber, lots of indigestible plant fiber to create a healthy and diverse microbiome. So it's not just, you know, kale, 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 and collards and things like that. It's also what we call max microbiota accessible carbohydrates. So that includes things like oats. It includes um, complex carbohydrates like brown rice, quinoa, which is really a seed, but we kind of consider it more a carb in that sense. So brown rice, quinoa, oats, legumes are huge. So lentils, chickpeas, all of those things, those are micro biota accessible carbohydrates that will increase the proportion of the healthy microbes and shift what they're producing. Because even it's not just about the bug that's there because microbes are pluripotential. What do I mean by that? I, Robin Chutkan, have the capacity to be very good, to be not so good, and to be very bad on occasion, like Saturday night in New York. So, you know, the microbes, same thing. They're, it's not like you're a good microbe and you only are producing the good butyrate short chain fatty acids. Microbes can shift what they're producing based on what's going on environmentally and what the circumstances call for. So you want to increase production of these healthy metabolites and drive production away from the neuroinflammatory metabolites. And that's really by encouraging the growth of the healthy species of the indigestible plant fiber, the microbiota accessible carbohydrates. Okay. Um, my teenage daughter, this is from Odna, doesn't sleep well, doesn't eat healthy, grumpy, moody, acne. How should I help her? Thanks. Oh, Odna, honestly, my heart really goes out to you. I, I feel what you're saying very profoundly. You know, when my daughter was little, and many of you know my journey with her, with uh, the C-section, minimal breastfeeding, 20 courses of antibiotics before she was too sick all the time as a kid. And when she was young, when I had full control, you know, I could fill her full of green smoothies and dal burgers and, and you know, uh, split pea soup. But she's 17 and, you know, they definitely, they want to strike out and sort of do their thing. And it's really, it's so hard and really heartbreaking to watch them not making great choices all the time. But here's the thing, Adna, they're learning, right? And even though we think like we know what they need to do, and we do, they have to figure it out. And, and I would remind you that most people, your daughter included, don't want to feel badly. And they don't want to have acne and feel crummy and all of that. But she's figuring out what she has to do to look differently, to feel differently, et cetera. And so I want you to focus with her, not so much on what she's doing wrong, because then they just tune you out. But I want you to encourage her to do some things right. So, okay, she's having mac and cheese, but encourage her, maybe even steam a little broccoli for her, right? To have with that and just say, I know you love your mac and cheese, but here's some broccoli to go with it to feed the good microbes. And, you know, the same thing with, uh, you know, not sleeping well and teenagers. So here's the thing about sleep and the CDC guidelines is first of all, two out of three Americans are not getting enough of it on a regular basis. We know that. But sleep helps you grow and learn and all of these things. You know, you, as I mentioned, you're setting down new neural pathways, et cetera. And the, the amount of sleep that you're getting changes as you get older, it tends to be less. So babies, for example, need a lot of sleep. They need about 16 hours because when they sleep, that's when they're cementing all the memories and all the things they learned during the day are getting laid down as more permanent memories as they sleep. And then teenagers, and I'll put all of this, I'm gonna literally take the excerpt from this whole like gut sleep chapter that I wrote that I'm so proud of, and I'm gonna have it as an next blog. So you're gonna have all of the actual numbers there, but um, teenagers need somewhere around 
eight to nine hours, depending on how old they are. And then we typically need seven to eight hours. So most teenagers are not getting enough sleep. And here's a really crazy story. In, in a county in Colorado, I believe it was, they decided to shift the time school started from 7.45 to 8.30. They made about a 45 minute shift. And the number of driving accidents by teens plummeted with the getting the extra hour of sleep in the morning. So I think it is cruel and unusual punishment for teenagers to have to get to sleep at 7.45, to have to get to school at 7.45 in the morning. They're just not wired that way. They go to bed later and they're, they wake up later and their circadian rhythm is a little bit different. So, you know, I'm very much an advocate for a later school start. I know it can be inconvenient for some parents, depending on where you work and how you get to work and whether you need to drop off. But our teenagers are definitely taking a toll by having to get up earlier. Um, okay, so oh, now back to you. So doesn't sleep well, doesn't eat healthy, grumpy, moody, acne. The other thing I want you to think about is making some smoothies for her that she might enjoy how they taste. So my green smoothie, she would not enjoy. <laughs> it's kale and collards and spinach and celery and parsley and lemon juice and maybe a little mango because I've gotten used to it and I like to fill it with as many greens as possible. But I want you to think about making a smoothie for her. That is something she might like. So it might be strawberries and bananas, maybe a little coconut milk yogurt or almond milk yogurt, and then put some spinach in there. She will not taste the spinach, I promise you. It will make the color kind of muddy and not so pretty. So you might wanna put it in something opaque that she doesn't see through, not a glass. Let me sip some more water here. And see if you can get a little bit of that into her. Um, and you know, again, rather than you got to go to sleep now, and blah, 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 you know, really encourage her. And maybe, you know, I talked about the sleep debt, but for teenagers, I think the rule of thumb is don't wake a sleeping teen unless you have to. When they sleep till one in the morning, it's because they really, they're tired. And even though going to bed at 2 a.m. and sleeping till 1 p.m. is not the way to do it, for teenagers, it's still better than waking them up. So let her sleep on the weekends, even though we as adults need to wake up and have a regular consistent schedule. Okay, and, and, and let me say that probably what she, you know, she's experimenting and hopefully if you model good behavior, good sleep habits, good eating habits, et cetera, without necessarily lecturing her, on what she should do. And trust me, I learned the hard way <laughs> with this. I did a lot of lecturing in my day. But if you model that, you'd be surprised at how eventually some of those behaviors might start to, to come in. Okay, so good luck. And I feel you for sure. Okay, hi, Renee. Why do some people with IBD or IBS have their worst problems in the morning after a good night's sleep? Yeah, you know, that has less to do with sleep and more to do with bowel activity. So Renee, you're absolutely right. People with Crohn's and colitis often say the mornings are the worst. I have patients who absolutely could not get a flight before noon. They just, the idea of, you know, getting up, getting to the airport, being in a car, all of that, and on a plane where they don't have immediate access to the bathroom is just not possible. But that's more about how the gut works. So the gut also has a bedtime. I'm fond of telling people, you know, it's tied to the light dark cycle also. So once the sun sets, our gut motility goes way down, which is why you should not be eating a cheeseburger at 11 o'clock at night. You shouldn't be eating anything at 11 o'clock at night, but particularly not something heavy like that. So the gut goes to sleep, the contractility, the digestive enzyme secretion, all of that really goes way down, shuts down as the sun sets. And what happens in the morning as the sun comes up is our gut comes alive, it becomes awake again, motility, secretion, et cetera. So if you have a chronic inflammatory condition like inflammatory bowel disease, that's when your gut is going to really come alive with bowel movements and gas and gargling and so on. So that is less related to the fact that you've had sleep and whether you've had a good night's sleep or not, and more just related to gut contractility, motility, secretion, and the circadian rhythm. Okay. I dare say though that Renee, that sleep deprivation will make that process worse, but unfortunately getting a good night's sleep does not shut that down when you have, uh, when you have inflammatory bowel disease. Okay, um, what do I think of the new med Motegrity? So that's a, a, a motility drug and it's a little off topic for gut sleep. So we'll definitely do something on motility and I promise you, Naomi, I'll get to Motegrity um, when we talk about that. Okay, 
How do I overcome constipation and achieve regular movements? Well, I think we had an office hours called Getting Regular. So I go back and take a look at that in on gutless.com. We have a bunch of free guides now that are organized by category. So we have one on constipation. I want you to take a look at that because we have some really great information on not just causes, but also how do you treat this, right? What do you do to, um, to get more regular? So I want you to take a look at that, Sherry. Um, Jay, what about non-melatonin over-the-counter natural sleep products like proper sleep? So I'm not familiar with proper sleep, but a lot of things that have echinacea in them or lavender and so on, you know, even for some of them, even though they're not scientifically proven necessarily, and maybe it's a placebo effect, but I think if it's something pretty unharmful, like lavender, echinacea, I think that's fine to take. So I just want you to take a good look at the ingredients in something like proper sleep. In fact, you know what? Let me look it up for you right now real quick. Um, proper sleep and see if there's anything objectionable in there. You know, they sneak that stuff in. Proper sleep supplements. Uh, it's sleep supplements and coaching. So I like that there's coaching too. Um, proper, huh? Okay, I'm looking for the ingredients. I see it here, but it's not showing me the ingredients. Um, oh, it's available with melatonin, available with hemp. Um, I'm not seeing the ingredients, but but I'm seeing something called Calm there, which I'm very familiar with, which has magnesium, which is great. So I use a lot of Calm in my practice. It's a magnesium product that's supposed to help you relax and I don't know how well it works, but it's great for bowel movements too. And if you take a small amount, it's not gonna give you diarrhea or anything. It's pretty gentle, but a lot of my patients take calm at night because they feel, and again, placebo effect, I don't know, but they feel that it does relax them and it really helps with bowel regularity. So calm is a product that I like a lot that I think works really well. Um, okay, sleep doctor said that since Tylenol helped me sleep, okay to take, it worked for a while. However, I cannot even take a half a 325 milligram of Tylenol now. I was hung over 24 hours. Does it gotta have something to do with this? So yeah, Kathleen, I, you know, again, I'm a big advocate of reminding people just because something works does not mean it's a good idea. If you were tired and I gave you some cocaine, you would probably pep right up. That is not a good idea. So Tylenol is not a drug for sleep and Tylenol works on the liver. And because our liver is busy detoxifying our bodies from all the other countless things that we do every day, toxins in the environment, alcohol, substances in food, most of us, our liver is pretty stressed. So adding acetaminophen, Tylenol to that, that has to be metabolized in the liver can put a big strain on your liver. Now taking 325 milligrams of Tylenol or even 650 milligrams of Tylenol is not going to cause liver toxicity. We really see problems with liver failure and so on at much higher doses, you know, six, seven, eight, nine, ten 10 grams of acetaminophen, but it's cumulative. And if you're taking other medications too that are potentially toxic to the liver, this can really add up. But I think the bigger point is Tylenol is just not a drug to be used for sleep. And so I, I have to say, I don't agree with your doctor that you should take Tylenol every day. Um, you know, you shouldn't really necessarily take anything every day unless it's really for a specific purpose. And then um, the hungover for 24 hours was, sounds like your response to the Tylenol, maybe for taking it for a long time. So that may be a sign that your liver is maybe having some trouble metabolizing it. Hard to, you know, I can't give you a definitive answer without, without knowing a bit more. And again, not giving you medical advice here. Um, forgot to say I'm on PPI, so has that affected the way I metabolize meds? Yes, it can, because remember that proton pump inhibitors change the pH of the gut in a very profound way. They basically remove the acid, which is digestion 101. We need stomach acid to digest food, etc. And additionally, that change in the pH changes the gradient of gut bacteria. So instead of having very low levels of gut bacteria in the stomach because of the high acid, when we get rid of the acid, we now have disruption of that and we have more bacteria in our GI tract and it sort of confuses the whole thing. And 
that can, the change in the gut bacteria can also lead to a change in the way drugs are metabolized because your microbiome is one of the main influencers of how drugs are metabolized. So keep that in mind also. Um, and, you know, if you can get off the PPI, talk to your doctor, whoever's prescribing it. If you're just on it for reflux, think about eating an uh, earlier dinner, less caffeine, less dairy, you know, sort of smaller meals, those things are all really helpful. Again, we have lots of good information on the Gutless site for that. If you go to the, um, the guide on reflux. Hi, Ellen. Um, what are some foods to eat at night as a snack that could aid in sleep and benefit the gut? Well, foods that have tryptophan, there's some nuts that uh, are high in tryptophan. So that would be something good to think about. And also, you know, we talked about a little bit of the tart cherry juice. So those are some of the things that I would mention as a snack. But remember that nuts are also high in fat. So you don't want to eat too many of them at night. Hi, Sarah. For IBD patients, if a generally overnight, if medication like an enema is disrupting sleep, is it possible to explore using these medications during the day? Absolutely, Sarah. That is such a great question. It all boils down to convenience for you and proximity to the bathroom. Usually we would recommend enemas at night because that's when people are, you know, still in one position. But for example, if you're working from home and you're able to use an enema during the day and not at night, so it's not disrupting your sleep, absolutely, that makes perfect sense. Go for it. Thank you for asking. Hi, Carrie. Hi. Um, do I consider waking several times post 3 a.m. for only 30 seconds detrimental? I do have good habits, et cetera. This may be a repeat question. Um, it really depends, Carrie. If you're, you know, flashing awake for 30 seconds later and going right back to sleep, it may not be super disruptive. If the episodes are for longer, you're having trouble going back to sleep, that may be different. But that sort of brief awakening um, doesn't sound like it would be super disruptive to your sleep cycle. Okay, any suggestions for dealing with sleep imbalances from traveling across multiple time zones? Yes. You know what's really interesting about this, Pratima, is that many people experience jet lag as a stomach ache. It can feel like it's almost in their gut. And, you know, I thought that was odd for many years until I started exploring the gut sleep connection. Now I'm like, oh, I don't think it's odd at all um, that people have gut symptoms when they're jet lagged. But here's the thing. Uh, and again, Matt Walker's book is fantastic check out the podcast on ritual or, and I don't have any connection to him. I don't even know him, but I just like to support people doing good work. Um, he also has a masterclass that's very good. So one of the things that he recommends is that when you get to the new time zone, you must immediately get into sync with their time zone. So I'll give you an example of what that means. If I leave DC, if I fly to, out of Dallas airport tonight and end up in Paris in the morning, even if I don't sleep on the plane, when I get to Paris and it's, you know, 7 a.m. and I'm now exhausted because let's say I didn't sleep on the plane. Let's say I stayed up reading the antiviral gut um, and I'm tired. Let's say I only slept three hours on the plane. I'm like, oh, well, it's still nighttime for me. If I left Dallas at 6 p.m. and I flew for seven hours, it's 1 a.m. It's 1 a.m. my time, but it's 7 a.m. Paris time. So it's 1 a.m. I want to go to sleep. Mm-mm-mm. -mm. I'm now in Paris, new time zone, light. You've got to stay awake and not go to bed till it is nighttime. So that adapting to the time zone that you find yourself in is really important. And in fact, it even extends to wearing dark glasses. So if you arrive in Paris at 7 a.m., everybody's going about their business or having their coffee and their croissant, their bright-eyed and bushy tail, because they've all had a good night's sleep in their bed, you've been awake on a plane you may be tempted to put on some dark glasses, right? Because you're just like, oh, there's glaring sunlight coming in. I'm not ready for this. Don't. Because even the sunlight is being blocked with the dark glasses can affect melatonin. So you want all that light coming into your optic nerve to increase melatonin, sorry, to decrease melatonin secretion because it's daytime and you want to be alert. So if you now block the sunlight with the dark glasses, the... Optic nerve is going to see less sunlight, melatonin is going to rise, and you're going to get sleepy, and you're going to want to go to sleep even more. So you want to, you've got to get onto that time zone and don't wear dark glasses in the daytime when you're trying to stay awake. Okay. Um, thank you, Sarah, for that really sweet note. Okay. 
Um, how can we find that 2020 Nature article about what drugs affects our gut? You know what I'm going to do? I'm going to figure out some way to post this stuff in the chat. Um, Leslie Ann, maybe you can answer on the chat if you're on here. Is that Nature Study in Gutless? I think it is. I think it is in one of our blog posts. But if it is, if you could just put in the chat to everybody which blog post it is in that Nature article. Okay. Um, I want to make sure I get to everyone's questions. Uh, thank you, Maria. Uh, okay. Be encouraged. All four of my kids, whom I feed as you, Robin, are grown, went their own way, then returned, owning their very clean eating. Yay, Carrie. Thank you so much for that. We needed to hear that, honestly. We all share recipes. It takes time, but will happen. Oh, Carrie, so, so do you hear that? Actually, I'm going back to who asked that question? Odna. Odna, Carrie wants you to know to be patient, take time, it will happen, okay, with your teenager. She will definitely get less grumpy. Oh, and read Lisa Demore's excellent book, Untangled, because it helps to understand the curious mind of a teenage girl. Okay. Yeah, I see Agnes saying thank you. Um, proper ingredients. Thank you, Jay. Every proper pill contains our unique ingredients. Sensorial ashwagandha to decrease the stress hormones, cortisol, and malondialdehyde, GABA, to reduce excitability and promote calmness, Venetron for helping falling and staying asleep, and valerian root extract. Okay, so I think the ashwagandha is fine. I think the valerian root extract is fine. I don't know about malondialdehyde dialdehyde, MDA. And um, I do know that GABA, the hormone in supplement form, doesn't have the same effectiveness as GABA that's produced. And again, one of the neurotransmitters produced by gut bacteria. So I don't see anything super objectionable in there except the malondialdehyde I, I would have to look up. Okay. Thank you for that though, Jay. Um, what is a good diet to decrease chances of dementia? Yeah, Al, you know, that is such a, it's so hotly debated right now between the people like Dean and Aisha Shurzai, two neurologists on the West Coast who wrote a book about Alzheimer's who say, you know, a completely plant-based diet is the way to go. And then the more sort of grain brain people like Perlmutter and people in his camp who say it's a more ketogenic diet. And I, I don't know that we have an exact answer, but clearly, clearly the things that we do know that affect cognition. So you have to take a good look in your medicine cabinet, yes. And from a diet point of view, processed foods, foods that have a lot of emulsifiers in them uh, are clearly problematic. And alcohol, not so great. I think that you definitely want to eat enough healthy plants and max microbiota accessible carbohydrates so that you have a healthy microbiome. We know that's essential. So those are some of the things. The finer points as to whether you eat some animal protein or not, how much, I don't think we really have the answer to that. I think there's probably room for some of that on the plate, but you definitely want to eat generally an unprocessed diet and a diet that's high in phytonutrients. So what are phytonutrients? P-H-Y-T-O nutrients. There are nutrients that come from plants, right? And you can't get the same effect from taking something from a supplement and you want to eat a variety. So when you think about the different colors, that's one of the best ways to do it or think about eating seasonally. So you want to make sure on your plate, you have some green, you have some orange, you have some yellow, you have some purple, you have some red. And that way, you know, you're getting all the various phytonutrients that you need. So I'm a big fan of this sort of like eating the rainbow and making sure that I'm getting a lot of different color. I don't like eggplant, so purple for me tends to be cabbage. Red is easy, strawberries, tomatoes, green is, there's, you know, hundreds of things, all the different green vegetables. Um, orange for me, it tends to be squash, but I like cantaloupe also. Yellow is usually some sort of lemon or citrus. Pineapple, I'm a big fan. I like mango too for the orange. So that's one of the really important ways to make sure you're getting all the nutrients, okay. Um, hi, Joan. Uh, you have to, Joan says, two clients with late diagnosis celiac 
both have anxiety, depression, and are on meds, would you supplement gut repair nutrients, glutamine and others, if their diets are now totally gluten-free? They're seeing me to lose weight. Fiber target is 20 to 30 grams a day. That's a good target. And both are on 50 to 70 grams carbs. Weight loss is good, but should I consider repair? So here is the thing, Joan. Um, we definitely have evidence that celiac disease is associated with dysbiosis, with altered gut microbes in many people, and also with leaky gut, right? So with increased intestinal permeability. As the gut lining improves over time, and in somebody with celiac disease, that's primarily taking out all gluten. So all wheat, rye, barley, anything with gluten, not even a nanogram of gluten is okay in somebody who actually has celiac disease, different from somebody who's gluten intolerant. So as you take all of that out, the gut lining should start to repair. So the permeability should start to tighten up and even more importantly, the villi, those finger-like projections that are the absorptive capacity of the bowel. You remember they're flattened down with celiac disease. They should start to come back up. And if they're looking at blood work, the antibodies should be normal, the celiac antibodies. So if they have been 100% gluten-free, if the antibodies are flat, meaning the anti-gliadin and the endomesial antibodies are negative, and they've had an endoscopy showing that the villi are back up, those are all three really important findings and, and really signs that the gut is healing. It's possible that their depression and anxiety are a result of the celiac, but remember these things are multifactorial. You know, there's situational depression and anxiety too. There's seasonal depression and anxiety. So it's hard to say for sure that the depression and anxiety are related only to the gut. But I think it's important, Joan, to get some objective evidence that the gut is healed through, you know, food journaling to make sure there's no gluten antibodies see like antibodies to make sure there's no exposure and an endoscopy to make sure that the gut is back to normal because there's no point giving glutamine and zinc and all these things if they're still eating gluten, if they're still having gluten in their diet, right? And the villi are not back to normal. So it's important to do that. You know, the, the data for glutamine is not hugely compelling. I will use it if a patient requests it because I don't think it's harmful but we don't have a ton of data. We just have a few studies showing that it's helpful to the gut lining. And of course, in addition to what you're taking, you have to think about what you need to remove. If you're still taking non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs, if you're still taking antibiotics, if you're still taking proton pump inhibitors, if you're still using steroids, you know, all of these other things, it doesn't matter how much glutamine you're taking if you're doing these other things that are harmful to the gut lining. So. Um, Joan, I'm glad you're working with them and, uh, you know, worth considering, but make sure that the celiac disease, that they're fully recovered from that. Okay. Um, hi, Kim. Thank you. Yeah, CBD for sleep. You know, I, I have to defer on that. I will say that the benefits of CBD, I think, are much exaggerated. <laughs> so if you're using something that's really low potency and you know, hard to know again, whether it's placebo effect. We don't really have good studies for CBD and sleep um, that are placebo, randomized placebo control, which means there's a placebo group and a blinded group. So we have more anecdotal reports and it's really hard to know. Most people are biased to think that CBD is gonna help. If you put a little oil that has low levels of CBD on and, you know, rub yourself down with that and it feels good, I think it's probably fine, but you definitely want to look at, you know, what's in it and the amounts. Okay. Um, peppers really bother my GI. Any ideas why? We got to put that off for another time because we're still kind of on sleep. Um, does gabapentin affect sleep? Yes, it can, uh, depending on how much you're taking. And um, okay, thank you, Joan, for that. Oh, I'm so glad. This is really nice. Monica, when to get, what to get off sleep meds. Thanks. Yeah. So, oh my goodness, we're over. It's always so great to spend time with you guys. Listen, I love this. Thank you all so much for showing up. And the recorded version of this will be on the website in a couple of days. I promise you, I'm going to get you that sleep blog. It will be with the next blog. If you don't want to miss it, sign up at gutless.com and um, join me next week for antibiotics and cognition. That one's going to be terrific. And then the last one of the month is going to be shy bowel, which is basically how not heeding the call to have a bowel movement when you first feel it can 
end up winding you up in the hospital and with serious chronic gut issues, okay? All right, bye everyone, till next time.